Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone doing right now? Good, excellent, great to hear. Well, I want to thank you all for coming on this wonderful Tuesday. I also want to thank B&H for having me. This is a great opportunity. Um, this is a topic I'm extremely passionate about, drone photography. Um, as uh, Alan just alluded to, I am writing a book about it. It's called The Handbook of Drone Photography. You can see it at dronephotographybook.com, and um, where you can pre-order and all that good stuff. Ultimately, I want you to walk away with a better understanding of how to use drones to get great photographs. Let's actually delve into the meat of this uh, entire lecture, which uh, is what is a drone? Let's start with the very basic stuff here. So a drone or a UAV, an unmanned aerial vehicle, is a type of unmanned aircraft. This has been a drone that's been sitting here the entire time. We'll get into this specific drone a little bit later. But drones have their roots uh, in the military. So different uh, governments use drones for combat aerial operations so they don't jeopardize their security personnel. And that's one of the main reasons why drones have a negative connotation and why they're a little controversial. But we're not going to talk about the controversial side of drones today. We're going to talk about the beautiful side of drones today, which are camera drones, which is a relatively new invention in the marketplace, almost like two years or so old at this point. So I think that's why a 19-year-old is poised to talk about this topic, because it's a very, very new medium. Um, so let's, let's talk about some applications for drones. So farmers can use drones to survey crops. Uh, construction companies can inspect infrastructure. First responders can use UAVs for search and rescue. And cartographers can map their surroundings from the sky. You can actually download an app on your iPhone or whatever device you have right now, and you can use a drone model such as this, and you could create a 3D model of your environment from the air using this exact piece of technology. Uh, lastly, companies like Amazon are exploring how drones can deliver products in less than 30 minutes. Now, the technology is certainly there for Amazon to do that today. In fact, they announced it quite a while ago now. But the problem is there are some uh, regulations that we'll get to later that kind of restrict them from doing this exact thing, which I think is extremely exciting. And lastly is storytelling, which is the focus of this particular presentation. Again, the more beautiful purpose for drones. So let's talk about the anatomy of the drone. So drones are either quadcopters, that is they have four motors. These are the motors right here. Um, they are either octocopters, which means they have six. This is a quadcopter, obviously. And hexacopters have eight motors as well. So quadcopters are the most common and inexpensive type of drones. That's what you're going to see on most of the market. All the Phantoms, most DJI products, um, for the most part, you're going to see are quadcopters. Although I wouldn't consider this particular drone inexpensive. This is about $5,000 for this drone right here. Um, that's what you're going to usually see on the lower price end for drones. So why hexacopter octocopters? Why do those things exist on the market if a quadcopter is cheaper? Well, hexacopters, which again uh, is, I'm sorry, octocopters and hexacopters, I'm sorry, hexacopters and octocopters, six and eight uh, motors. Um, the reason why they're on the market is they have redundancy. So the fact that they have multiple motors means if one of these guys were to fail in the air, uh, your drone won't just go crashing to the ground. The other motors will get in there, make up for it, and will be able to safely land. So why drones? Why are, am I into drones? Why this magnificent technology? And why use it if you actually want to use it for art and, and all those great stuff? So they give, drones are an artist's dream medium. They give indiv individuals the opportunity to appreciate the breadth and scale of their world. So this is of sheep grazing in central California on the west coast. From the dawn of civilization, the skies have enchanted our imagination. I know it's enchanted my imagination because I remember at a young age, around six or so, I was drawing these schematics and blueprints for a, a helicopter car. And obviously, I never you know, actually made the helicopter car. Otherwise, I would have been a millionaire. But, um, but I've always been really into flying and how I can use flying and the idea of flight to impact and change the world. With UAV technology, you can elevate your imagery to literal and figurative heights. This is of a roundabout in Houston, Texas. And utilizing, the, uh, utilizing drones, the photographs and videos we create are no longer constricted by human limitations. Again, you can go to places you can't go with your feet, you can't go with your arms. This is of Akaka Falls in Hawaii. This is the largest uh, uh, island in the Hawaiian Islands in the South Pacific. So we're going to do you know, a really quick demo. I don't know if you guys already have drones or if you're interested in getting drones, both of which is important. But this is a diagram that will basically show you what I'm doing down here. So um, in case you can't see what I'm doing down here, you can always look up here. Basically, there are two controls on each uh, stick. On the left stick, you got left and right. Uh, that is the yaw. That is basically the orientation of the drone. So I say yaw is probably the oh. most important and hardest to learn of the oh. different controls. Basically, you want your drone most of the time to be nose out, which is facing away oh. from you, uh, having the camera facing away from you. For if, so if you guys were flying, you'd want it like this, right? Um, what that allow, and yaw, basically, if you turn it to the right, so if you move this to the right, 
it will move the drone uh, clockwise. If you move it to the left, it would move the drone counterclockwise. So this allows you not only to explore your environment, but also obviously control the direction in which the drone is flying. The only problem why I say yaw is difficult is because if you are not properly oriented, your controls can be inversed. So let's say this drone was facing toward me the wrong way. That means all my controls are inverse and I could easily crash it because I'm confused. Um, so how do you make sure you are always oriented nose out? Well, there are indicator lights on dr most drones, including this drone, right here and here, and also on here and here. And that allows you to be able to see, they're color coded, they allow you to see which is nose out and which is the opposite way as well. Mo the rest are pretty self-explanatory. This is the throttle right here. This allows it uh, to get more power in the motors and actually lift off. This helps you descend, of course. And then as we move to the right stick, right here, um, this is roll and pitch. Uh, this is roll and that's pitch. Um, basically, all that means is so long as your nose out, you go, it goes the direction that you want it to go. So this is left, this is right, that's forward, and that's back. So really basic stuff. But I think it's extremely important to learn how to fly. You know, beyond this as well, there are flight simulators, uh, both DJI and 3DR. They offer flight simulators with their drones that actually work with the controller you purchased. And that allows you, you know, to practice and simulate different conditions, you know, whether that is uh, different wind conditions or stuff like that. So where to fly? So find a location that's worthy of your drone's battery life. Like I said, this is only effectively 10 minutes. You need to know where you're going, and you have to have a goal in mind and, and previously envisioned uh, if you want to uh, get effective imagery. So I say start locally. You know, think of things that are nearby, attractions, iconography, different features, things that are really interesting nearby that you can get great photos of. Um, ask yourself some questions about that place. So you can use tools like Google Maps and Google Images to basically see the lighting, how the different lighting will look around here. So during sunrise and sunset, where will the sun be in relation to the object you want to photograph? Is there a place where there's enough room for me to take off and land? Um, the questions like that, what will the background look like as well? Those are all very important questions to ask before you go to a location. Get inspired. You know, look at images on websites like 500px, Instagram, and Flickr. Those websites uh, allow you to evaluate photography and see you know, what do you like and what you don't like about certain aerial photos. And you can use that to figure out how you want to mold your own kind of style. I want to show how something as basic as the exposure triangle applies to drone photography. So we're going to delve a little bit into that. So this is the exposure triangle. This is real basic for photography. But these three things ultimately control the amount of light that gets into your photo and the resulting frame. So again, you could create interest not just through symmetry, but also through lighting. So while this is a relatively symmetrical image, I think most of the depth of this photograph is created by the lighting. Remember this scene? We circled around this uh, lighthouse before. The sun was coming from the left, and so that's where it's light on the left side. And then the darkness of the right side helps create an inherent depth that wouldn't be there otherwise. So again, geometrical interactions are what makes symmetry effective. So again, circles and triangles and roundabouts. All these things are, you know, symmetry can be found anywhere. It can be found in cities um, because they're part of efficiency. Roundabouts like this and symmetrical uh, streets and roads are all part of city planning because it adds to efficiency of that city. Texture is the last uh, compositional element we're going to talk about. It creates this kind of uh, visual feature that promotes sensory exploration because a two-dimensional image can become three-dimensional with just a little bit of texture. This is Niagara Falls again. And so you can see not just the nice fluffy mist, but you can also see the rough rocks and the greens of the uh, trees above the very powerful Niagara Falls as it dumps into the Niagara River. And again, cliffs along the California coast. Um, so as our memories of how things feel are so ingrained in our consciousness, you know, the sight of texture brings like a vivid sensation of touch, so you feel like you're more in the photograph and you're more there. So now that I talked about you know, composition and lighting, I just want to make it super clear, especially anyone who has DSLR training, how much stuff you can do with a drone. So there are different camera modes, as I alluded to when I showed that screenshot. You can shoot in auto, manual, and priority modes. Now, in my experience, I would always shoot in manual when it comes to drones, because I know that people say that for DSLR photography, too, when you're on the ground. But uh, especially with drones, I've always found that the priority modes just don't get the feeling I'm trying to get. If I try to do a long exposure and I set a specific shutter speed and shutter priority mode, it's just not getting the kind of, comp uh, the kind of light I want in the frame. And it involves a lot of exposure compensation. And ultimately, it's just better to be in manual at that point. Different file types, so uh, JPEG and RAW. RAW is super important for anyone who hopes to do a lot of uh, post-processing with their imagery, um, especially if they want to really bring out the darkness into light. 
Um, so the ability now to shoot in RAW, and also for people who are also JPEG fans, you can shoot in JPEG plus RAW as well. You can get all sorts of different filters for this. Uh, they make filters specifically for this camera that includes an ND filter, a neutral density filter. I would only use really an ND filter in the case of Niagara Falls picture if I'm trying to get a long exposure in that instance because it darkens the frame and allows you to do long exposure photography even in midday. There's also polarizing filters that reduce the glare of the blues of the sky, the blues of the water below makes for a greater color, colorization of your imagery. In terms of maintenance, there's very little you have to do in terms of maintaining your drone. Um, you have update firmware, so regularly different companies such as DJI um, will release a new update to their drone that will uh, you know, take out bugs, release new features, stuff like that. Um, and so if you, upload, uh, if you update your firmware, you'll have new features on your drone. But there's also, uh, in terms of maintenance, it's great to have extra parts. Now, especially extra propellers, these guys, again, come off very easily. This is a little plastic thing, right? This can break relatively easily. And so I always say that you know, propellers are the fender benders of, uh, of drone crashes. So if you ever crash your drone, the first thing that's going to go is the propellers. So it's always great to have extra propellers. Some drones, such as these, actually ship with extra propellers. This has all four of them. I've already messed up a few of them. A lot of drones actually ship in different cases. This is my case for this particular drone. Um, but these cases are usually short-term solutions um, to how you're going to store your drone. There are backpacks that are really great for adventures if you're hiking and you want to bring your drone somewhere. For instance, like Akaka Falls would be great to have that backpack as I went to that uh, waterfall in Hawaii. Um, and also a roller case, which is great for long-term storage. So companies like Pelican and, um, and Think Tank, they have these great hard roller cases that make sure the contents inside your drone are never damaged. And also, they have inside of them very soft case that individually uh, separates the different parts of your drone for easy assembly and also to make sure nothing gets uh, damaged inside. And the last thing I'd say is these lithium batteries. If you're ever flying on a plane, do not check them under the plane. They'll remove them and confiscate them. The only, thing you're, only place you're allowed to bring this is as a carry-on item. Um, that's because these lithium batteries uh, cannot deal with non-pressurized situations or else they might um, blow up. So rules and regulations, this is my least favorite part of this presentation, but unfortunately you got to stay uh, you know, legal in all of your drone operations. Um, so first, register your drone with the FA online. This costs $5. You receive a unique identification number. I'm not going to show mine on camera, but you just put a label on the back with your identification number. Um, and what that allows you to do, the FAA has a database of all the people who are flying drones. And so in case you ever get an accident, you ever hurt someone, you're actually held responsible for your actions. So that's why the FAA uh, does that. And so that's the website if you want to register a drone. Don't fly within five miles of an active airport, especially without contacting the control tower first. That's another FAA regulation. Um, once again, uh, these technologies are trying to keep us within legal bounds at all times. Now, it's not the responsibility of the technology to keep you within legal bounds. It's your responsibility. But there's things called um, ge geofencing that allows you to uh, stay away from those sensitive areas. So it won't let you take off within five miles of an active airport, for instance. Um, so steer clear of that sensitive infrastructure I'm talking about. So not only is that airports, but that you know stadiums in the middle of a game, um, military bases, national parks, unfortunately, have outlawed all drones um, as well. Um, uh, also, maintain a line of sight with your drone. That's another FAA regulation. Uh, you can have an observer. That's totally legal. You can have someone else who's watching your drone for you as you're focused on flying. Um, and so again, because of depth perception, you don't want to crash your drone. You don't want to lose sight of your drone. And hope, hopefully, you'll never have to use the return to home feature. Um, never ind endanger individuals or property. And I'll go a step further. Don't try to break people's privacy and, and get into their personal space. And this is why this technology is so controversial, is because of privacy considerations such as that. And so don't be the person who ruins it for everyone. Um, be aware of state and local laws. So not only does the FAA have regulations, but sometimes state and local uh, municipalities and stuff like that have gotten involved and had their own regulations as well. So in addition to the five, so if we think of New York City, for instance, in addition to that five mile radius I'm talking about, which kind of excludes a lot of space because you got Newark, you got JFK and LaGuardia, I'm sorry, LaGuardia and JFK. Um, because of that, you, there's only a limited space in New York City you can fly. And then on top of that, the Parks Department does not let you take off uh, from within one of their parks as well. So um, you have to be aware of those kinds of laws anytime you're flying in any new location. Lastly is commercial use, well, second to last commercial use. Um, 
there, the FAA separates things between hobbyists and, uh, and com like a professional or a commercial user of drones. So anyone can fly this for pleasure at any time, but if you expect to make money off of it, uh, originally you had to get a certain exemption. It was called the 333 exemption. You had to petition the FAA. It was like an eight-month process. They were falling behind on everything. It involved a lawyer. It was no fun for anyone involved. So they've just recently, about two or three weeks ago, have changed it. And now um, it's going to be rolled out, I believe, next month. But all you have to do is take an aeronautic knowledge test and pass a background check, and you can make money off of your drones relatively easily. So to insure or not to insure, again, this is an expensive piece of equipment. Uh, you should make a conscious decision whether you want to insure your device or not. Um, you can insure, um, you know, for instance, the most important thing with this is liability insurance. If you accidentally hurt someone or, or hurt someone's property, um, you want to make sure you're covered so you have peace of mind at all times. So you can actually get, you know, homeowner's insurance will insure a drone for just a meager dollars extra per, per month and protect you in those cases as well. Anything else? Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.